good morning to all our viewers in india i suspect we won't have too many viewers from europe it's uh, still very early in the morning and uh, uh, probably not too many from the east coast as well of the united states uh, this is our 41st webinar that's being hosted by the iit alumni center bengaluru uh, since the pandemic began and we've had an overwhelming good morning to all our viewers in india i suspect we won't have too many viewers from europe it's uh, still very early in the morning and uh, uh, probably not too many from the east coast as well of the united states uh, this is our 41st webinar that's being hosted by the iit alumni uh, center bengaluru uh, since the pandemic began at the youtube at your end I'm getting an echo uh, no no your youtube you have to cut you may have youtube on so just cut it in here the youtube at your end getting an echo yeah let me cut the youtube at my end sorry yes yes this is our first webinar okay <laughs> i'm sorry about that no just raise that uh, yeah so i switch off that uh, so uh, uh, this is our 41st webinar as i just mentioned and uh, uh, today there is an interesting topic uh, we are all living in a in a period of interesting churn uh, new acronyms are coming up there is quad and there is aucus and so on and so forth and a lot of technology is uh, being the battlegrounds right now with the us and china battling for tech supremacy uh, and of course the technology items would be uh, semiconductors 5g and beyond uh, artificial intelligence and space where a whole new play is emerging both for strategic reasons and for exploitation Uh, i am reminded of a small anecdote that was shared with me by professor paul raj i don't know if he recalls about two and a half years ago when i met him at the taj west end he mentioned that when he walked into a university in china and he was crossing the street at an well let's call it an illegal place meaning not a pedestrian crossing he heard the speakers blare out saying professor paul raj that's not a place where you should be crossing the road uh, what that means is that there were cameras all along that grabbed his feed uh, there was an uh, ai algorithm of some sort that recognized who he was and they picked the right speaker to beam out and tell him that he is committing a crime so it's minority report uh, in some sense right wow. uh, so uh, so that was <clears throat> something that he had uh, you know shared with me a couple of years ago Uh, i will have professor ashok mishra the president of iit acb uh, and professor mishra everybody knows uh, uh, former director of iit bombay amongst many other things uh, he will introduce professor paul raj and our moderator nitin pai uh, for the audience uh, we do not uh, you know monitor the chat box for any questions so if you have q and a please put it in the q and a box at the bottom right hand of your screen uh, that's being monitored and uh, nitin will uh, look at those and then you know during his moderation he will be bringing up those questions uh, please do not put it on the chat box we will really not be uh, able to service that uh, finally uh, uh, also don't bother raising hands because that doesn't work uh, you know today we expect a fairly large crowd so that may not work so raising hands will not do it just put your questions in the q and a box and we will take it from there with that professor mishra over to you to introduce our speaker and our moderator thanks ashok <clears throat> it's indeed my great pleasure to introduce our illustrious speaker for today's iit acb webinar professor arogya swami paul raj I have known Professor Paul Raj for about twenty-five years, since the time I was the Dean of Alumni Affairs and International Programs at IIT Delhi. At that time, I had the privilege of introducing him at the ceremony for the IIT Delhi Distinguished Alumnus Award in nineteen ninety-eight. Later, I have interacted with him on several occasions, and am always in awe of what all he has done and achieved. Professor Paul Raj joined the Indian Navy in 1961 and completed the courses in military subjects and electronics 
engineering in 1966, obtaining first rank in both. He received his doctoral degree in electrical engineering from IIT Delhi in 1973 under the guidance of Professor Indresen while on deputation from the Indian Navy. Later on, he headed a team of the Naval Oceanographic Laboratory in Cochin to develop the very large sonar systems, giving India the most advanced solar sonar technology. He then supervised the development of large system software suit for parallel computers at the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, known as CDAC, and concurrently supervised the development of radar and communication systems at Bharat Electronics Limited, who remember him very fondly. He was the founding director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics and the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, both located in Bangalore. He then moved to Stanford University to become a professor there. His has been a remarkable journey from being a naval officer to become an outstanding scientist in the world. Currently, Paul Raj is an emeritus professor at Stanford University in USA. He is the inventor of multiple input, multiple output technology, amongst many others, which is the core technology in all modern wireless systems, including 5G, 4G, and Wi-Fi. In 2019, this was recognized by the Electrical Engineering Department as among the top three contributions of the department over its existence over 125 years since, 19, since 1894. Remarkable <clears throat> achievement. His recognitions include the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the National Inventors Hall of Fame, the Marconi Prize, the IEEE, IEEE Alexander G. Bell Medal, and national awards from the government of India and China. He is a member of the national academies around the world, including the US National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of course, Tri IEEE, and all the four science and engineering academies in India. Paul Raj founded three wireless semiconductor companies in the Silicon Valley that were later acquired by Intel, Broadcom, and Hewlett-Packard Enterprises. Again, remarkable achievement. And coming back to India, his awards in India include the Ati Vishish Seva Medal from the Navy, Scientist of the Year Award from DRDO, and the very prestigious Padma Bhushan Award by the Indian government in 2010. We are indeed very privileged to have him today and look forward to his talk on high technology. Today we have Nitin Pai as our moderator. He is a co-founder and director of Takshashila Institution, an independent center for research and education in public policy. His current research includes information warfare and high tech geopolitics. He teaches international relations and public policy at the Takshashila Graduate Program. Nitin's regular columns appear in The Mint, which is one of my favorites, and The Print. He was a gold medalist from the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew uh, School of Public Policy. And prior to that, an undergraduate scholar at Nanyang Technological University and an alumnus of National College Bangalore. So today we see we have two Bangaloreans on our webinar. He has worked in various capacities in the telecommunications industry, including in satellite design and undersea cable projects. Before founding Takshashila, he spent more than a decade at the Singapore government as a policy maker in the technology sector. So um, now over to uh, Professor Arugasami Paul Raj to give his lecture. We are so happy to have both of you with us today. <clears throat> OK, 
can you see my slide the uh, show yes for all good okay good okay so thank you ashok for this kind remarks and also thanks also to the iit alumni center in bangalore for hosting this uh, interaction and also to the volunteers dr venkat raman and uh, dr mr kamath for making all this happen thank you uh, iit acb has been a has been great service to foster a public discourse on important subjects and i hope today's event will meet the high standards set by the previous speakers uh, technology is becoming increasingly important today in today's world and the high technology is now the crucial battleground for economic leadership in my remarks today i will keep i'll keep it strictly on us and china india will not be will not be discussed i also will stick to civil technologies and not address military so with that Paul, uh, yeah uh, can you put it on full screen full screen okay sure full screen mode thank you okay good so so let's get started so the uh, i want to look at per capita gdp uh, going from around 1200 uh, uh, bce to uh, today and if you look at it you find from the from the 12th to 13th century onwards the per capita gdp was pretty uh, pretty constant uh, for almost till about the middle of 18th century uh, that's because uh, the india and there were the three big economies india china and uh, europe they're all agrarian economies and very similar in, in you know, per capita gdp i think it's about 400 dollars in 1990 dollars and uh, and typically you know occasionally china would go ahead sometimes india would go ahead but they're all pretty much similar a lot of this work was done by a cambridge scholar angus madison so many of you may know about him around 17 uh, middle of 18th century with the west began to industrialize with the invention of steam power so that was the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution followed in the early part of the 20th century when the united states led it with mass manufacturing so we really invented uh, you know mass mass manufacturing in this country and then this, the third industrial revolution followed with the uh, arrival of information technology in the 1970s so in some sense we are now in the third industrial revolution and uh, with the advent of these revolutions the us uh, west and later us uh, per capita gdp began to rise and today we are the us is at 64000 uh, dollars per capita and uh, uh, what about china china didn't really industrialize uh, till about 1980s actually i'll talk a little bit more about it later and there's only 1980 thanks to deng xiaoping they began to open up and and uh, move forward so at that time they were about 200 years behind uh, the west in terms of starting to, inter- uh, to to get into technology and today there are about they are about 10.5000k uh, uh, per capita which is much much smaller than uh, than us and about 17.5 in purchase parity terms still about only about 28% of us so so china is actually if you look at uh, per capita gdp ranks only about 70th 80th in the world so it's really a, it's actually behind thailand so it's very much a developing country in, in terms of per capita gdp so the one big question from the picture is how come that uh, it did not uh, uh, industrialize along with the west particularly because it had a strong history of technology back in these ab- about 600 years ago so there's not a scholarship on that including at stanford but what happened and why so uh, now let's come to gdp itself so gdp itself uh, uh, while per capita per capita gdp is really the measure of the well-being of citizens the, the gdp itself uh, gross gdp is also valuable because as uh, for investments in apex areas like technology and military a percentage of the gdp can be large the gdp is large so for example we have say 2% gdp percent in rnd and the large gdp that's a lot of numbers so so uh, gdp does matter and uh, 
And uh, today, uh, US uh, uh, GDP is 25 trillion. And China, in terms of uh, PPP, is almost similar, 25 trillion, maybe a little higher. But in terms of exchange rate terms, uh, China is about 15.5 trillion. But well, more, mostly within the next 15, 20 years, uh, China will overtake the uh, United States, even in exchange rate terms, uh, partly because it's a much, much larger population. So, uh, uh, of course, the GDP components right, in US and China are very different, and we'll talk about that soon. So, one thing, uh, because there's a lot of military people in this call, uh, I thought I'd talk about civil versus military technologies. But 50 years ago, uh, civil electronics, for example, could have been a valve radio. I remember I used to have a four valve UMS radio. Uh, was the price for the possession. But if you went on board a naval ship, I mean, you would see radars and sonars and fire control computers. Uh, those days it's electromechanical, very, very far ahead of what we had at home. So the military was far ahead. But around the 1980s, uh, civil technologies began to surge. And today, the civilian technologies are way ahead of, of, of military. And uh, for example, uh, not. Of course, military has its own domain where civil don't play, but in many of the areas I'm going to talk about, civil, uh, civil technology is far ahead. For example, if you look at semiconductors, the, uh, the investments in the in United States, uh, uh, our investments are about $150 billion per year, R&D. Investments by military, the Department of Defense, is only about two or three billion. In fact, they just do that for, uh, very, very critical programs, they want to ensure security of the supply chain. So they really rely on civil technology because the R&D engine is so much larger. So uh, this is an important thing to, real, to, 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 be, to, to keep in mind because it's civil that's pulling the military forward. So let's talk about GDP components now. So um, I'm sorry for all these numbers, it's a bit boring, but I thought it will set the stage for more discussion later. So when uh, one look at GDP, particularly for an industrialized economy, the uh, over 25% of that is called knowledge intensive. So it sort of needs uh, the very, very highly skilled or medium skilled people to, to, to function there. And then the rest of it is, uh, is kind of low tech. So knowledge intensive uh, is about 25% of GDP in the US. Uh, of which uh, there's one element called high-tech manufacturing, which is, uh, I'll discuss that uh, later. And then there's a medium tech manufacturing and services. So services uh, like IT services are considered medium tech. Then of course, the lower tech things are, are uh, agriculture, steel, real estate in terms of manufacturing and services in terms of transportation, retail and food. So, uh, so this 25% is where the knowledge intensive sector lies in. And uh, now let's talk about that particular sector. That 25% is, uh, can be broken again down to uh, three subsectors. The top 4.5% of that 25% is, is the real high technology, high technology manufacturing. It's compute, telecom, and AI uh, systems, semiconductors, which make up, which is the core component of these systems. A patented pharma, these are or, or branded pharma. These are the drugs which are in, discovered and therefore have patents and have high margins and they, when they sell them. Uh, commercial jets, uh, Boeing and uh, Airbus. And advanced instrumentation, which is mostly actually instrumentation required to manufacture semiconductors, also sometimes also in, in, in pharma industry or, or pharma research. So this is the high tech part. This is about 4.5% of US, uh, US GDP. Now the 7.5% uh, GDP is what I call manufacturing, medium tech manufacturing. So automobiles, machine tools, CAT scan, CAT scan, MRI machines, and so on and so forth. And of course, also uh, generic pharma. So in fact, India has a lot of generic pharma. We have a lot of auto and machine tools manufacturing too. And then the about 13% is uh, medium tech services. IT services like the, like the wireless networks, uh, 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 internet services, uh, you know, Facebook and all these sort of things, e-commerce, fintech, 
So it means the medium tech services, uh, which uh, themselves, uh, uh, you know, are not very complex, but uh, but they do ride on the core technology, which is much much more much deeper. So let's look at the market share, high tech, uh, high technology market share. Uh, I'm going to now, okay, I'm going to focus now only on on the high technology area. So that's again to reiterate: computing, telecom, and semiconductors, patented pharma, commercial jets, and advanced instrumentation. The the uh, so let's look at the market shares in these areas. So now we start breaking down U.S., China, and rest of the world. ROW. Core ICT, which is actually the, the king of all these technologies, uh, US and China are about parity, 30%, 32% in terms of revenue. And the rest of the world is about 38%. And it turns out that a lot of the 38% sits, sits in Taiwan and in Singapore. When it comes to branded pharma, uh, they are, I mean, uh, these are companies, uh, in quote, in, in tech, of course, you know, Big names, uh, just Intel, uh, Nvidia, in the United States, China, it's Huawei, ZT, CICT, and the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, good names would be TSMC in Taiwan, uh, could be Samsung in Korea. In branded pharma, of course, we have uh, uh, companies like J J and J. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, Merck, and so on and so forth. U.S. is the uh, uh, what happens about a third of your global GDP, their global revenue there. China is, uh, is still well behind, it's, uh, but it's catching up. And, uh, but in fact, the bulk of the mass is outside the US and China, it's actually in Europe, uh, slightly in Japan. And, uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, another big, this is about 1.5 trillion, this is another 1.5 trillion. Advanced instrumentation, which I mentioned is for semiconductors and for, for bio-research and so on and so forth, that's about half a trillion. And 30% is the US, uh, China is a little bit behind and the rest of the world is about 45%. And commercial jets, which is uh, in the ones we fly in, um, US is 35%, largely with Boeing and a little bit with others. Uh, China is well behind. I mean, they have a lot of planes, but they're not selling internationally. Mm -hmm. So uh, China has got, of course, they've got this regional jets, ARJ-21, which is many, some of you may have flown in, uh, but they're bigger single island, double, dual aisle jets, wide body jets from the Comac Corporation, I think C911 and C919 are only in service in China. They have not been able to sell them abroad as yet. And of course, the, the, the rest of the world is that we have, uh, we have uh, uh, Bearbus in Europe, Embraer from Brazil, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, Bombardier from, from Canada, uh, Airjet from France, and so on and so forth. They make 55, 58%. There's also about half a trillion dollar market. But, so, but to see, where I'm going, now on, I'm going to focus only on, focus only on this, because this is the, the critical technology. In fact, none of these things can function without this thing. So, in fact, uh, the real, the real uh, uh, competition between US and China is all core ICT. So, in, in doing these allocations, I allocate based on headquartered country. So, for example, you take a, a company like Broadcom, a US company, which uh, I used to work with as an advisor. We have R&D and manufacturing all over the world, maybe in 30 or 25 places, but it's headquartered in, in, in Irvine in California. So for the US company, and therefore it's under US government control. If US government says you can't sell a chip to, uh, let's say to Malaysia, even the chip is designed in Malaysia, uh, Broadcom will not be able to sell it. So it's very important to, to understand that. Therefore the uh, headquarters companies is where the power lies an allocation based on headquarters company. <clears throat> so now let's look at the, let's look at the uh, uh, components of, of ICT. Um, uh, so and I'm focusing, it's about uh, uh, $1.5 trillion market annual revenue. Semiconductors is about 520 billion. Uh, other components and modules, including optical, optical is getting more and more importance, about 110 billion. 
systems, consumer systems. So it could be phones, it could be uh, you know, uh, laptops and things like that, about 600 billion. Uh, systems are the, the, the enterprise systems. It could be 5G base stations, infrastructure, 5G RAN, uh, you know, uh, uh, data centers, like pictures are shown there. That's about 200 billion. And then uh, it turns out for these systems, they, they, they are finally put together by fairly low skill labor. Uh, the equipment, uh, the technology for assembly is very high, 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 high tech, but the labor is very low tech. That's about 70 billion. And the total is about $1.5 trillion. And of this, about $500 billion goes back into R&D, gets plowed back into R&D. So it's a huge, huge R&D machine. And uh, in terms of semiconductors, the big driver today is, is AI chips. I'll, I'll talk about that. AI is now driving uh, very, very complex semiconductors. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, NVIDIA, for example, is the top uh, supplier in the United States. Uh, as such, uh, AI chips with model sizes go up, goes up to about 100 billion, 100 billion uh, uh, neurons or uh, uh, 100 billion model sizes, which is huge. But uh, thanks to some new technology, GRP3 and transformers uh, in, for AI, uh, recently discovered, the model sizes have gone up to about 5 trillion to 10 trillion. In fact, Baidu in China has those, those chips now. So, so 5G and AI is a huge battleground and semiconductors is, is where a lot of this goes on. So because the, now in semiconductors, of course, there are two parts, the design part, uh, which is where, uh, where I, did, I did two companies doing that. But the, uh, the, the more difficult part is the fabrication part. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, um, I think I should go, go back a little bit. Yeah, so um, let me see. No, that's fine. So uh, yeah, so let's look at semiconductors. So uh, in US, uh, uh, the fab, that's only the fabrication part, is now pretty small. It was at one time, maybe 40 years, 40 years ago, we were close to 100%, but now it's come down to 8%. And our technology node, which is the size of the, of the line, line size called the node, that's to about 12 nanometers. It sort of rests on an investment base of 40, 40 to 50 billion that, that's been happening over the recent years. Within three or four years, everything gets obsolete. So it's only the last three years investments make sense. And there's uh, generally the investments for the next 10 years is about 70 billion. I mean, there's only three companies here. There's uh, uh, Intel, uh, TI, and, uh, and, uh, and Micron. And uh, uh, this, the, these numbers are pretty small. The US government is trying to invest and uh, I'll tell you about what's going on there. China is also uh, not very, uh, it's only about 8%. There are many more fabs. There's SMIC, they've got about at least, uh, and of course, uh, some of the Jap uh, Taiwanese and the Sams and, and the Koreans also manufacture in China. Altogether, China is only about 8%. They're also sitting at 12 nanometers. So they're not really at the top technology level, but they put a lot more money into it. Uh, uh, so investment base probably 150 billion because a lot of capacity is built up there. And they're now planning to invest 1.4 trillion over the next 10 years. You know, thousand, this is what the announcement made in Beijing about a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm not sure if all of it for, for a fab, but I, I believe as far as here it is. So Taiwan, Taiwan actually is very good. That is the leader. Taiwan leads with 60% market share the most complex of technologies. And there are two, two make companies there, TSMC and UMC. I, my chips I did at TSMC for many, many years ago. And they have control now the five nanometer uh, uh, technology, which is the deep, very complex technology. And uh, they've probably invested about 250 billion based on which they're manufacturing. And they announced another 300 billion to, uh, over the next 10 years. And this is uh, TSMC and UMC. Uh, and uh, fabs are really based on fab equipment uh, also. And here there are you know, four major companies. ASML is a Dutch company, which makes the lithographic machines. I'll talk about that. 
applied materials, uh, there's a lot of this uh, sputtering and CVD machines. Uh, this is actually locally here in Silicon Valley. I mean, they have R&D all over the place, but uh, they have recorded here. Uh, uh, Lamb Research is another US company also here in Silicon Valley. They too make some comp stuff for the fabs. And there's also a Japanese company called Tokyo Electronics. So uh, just talking about uh, for fine nanometers, you have to use extreme ultra ultraviolet rays to do the lithography. We need very low wavelengths. So this is a, a, a EUV ASML uh, lithographic machine. And those blue light actually shows the extreme ultraviolet, very high technology. This is the size of a truck. And this costs about $125 million. And a, and a reasonable fab needs about 10 of them. So it's already, you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, 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 more than $1.5 billion of just little machines, leave alone other things. So at five nanometers, today's fabs are about $20 billion. I think, I think 12 nanometers probably probably about 10 or so. But by the next year, by, by, but these things that keep increasing, I think in five years, the fabs will go to 40 billion and probably be at 80 billion in 10 years time. So these are huge, huge investments. And it's a very difficult business to run because there's lots of, uh, you know, uh, uh, glut and uh, shortages. Right now there's a shortage of chips, but uh, there's overcapacity built up. So then there'll be a glut. So with so much of investments, you've got to make money. So people keep running the fabs to get the money out, but then there's oversupply and uh, price falls. So it's not only technology, but I'll talk about it more. It, it's also a business sense is important. But this is the area where uh, more than anything else where the battle now lies. <clears throat> so uh, now I'm going to talk about, uh, about uh, the, the uh, uh, might have missed a slide. No, okay, fine. So let's talk about how uh, US uh, grew to become such a dominant player. So US actually was innovation led model. So, you know, <clears throat> I put a few down and uh, I mean, Clystron was uh, invented in the forties at Stanford, Varian Brothers, uh, Mobile Wireless, uh, you know, at Bell Labs, uh, Amos Jewel, Microprocessor invented at Intel, Ted Kerhoff and Federico Fajin. Uh, Ted was Stanford graduate. So sometimes we claim that it's also our invention. The internet uh, uh, flying rock at UCLA, uh, and then of course the TCP IP protocol was Windsurf and Bob Kahn. Wint was actually a professor at Stanford, uh, assistant professor at one time. He did his work when he was with, uh, working for DARPA. MIMO was invented uh, by Stanford, as Ashok mentioned. Deep neural networks, which is really a huge area now. Uh, again, uh, Jan Lacun at, uh, at, at New York and uh, and Jeff Hinton, uh, big names there in uh, Jeff Hinton in, in, in Toronto, and a few more things. But all of these have you know, created hundreds of billion dollars of, of industries. And uh, and uh, behind this was of course was Bell Labs, which, uh, uh, but also Stanford was a Stanford who trained Clystron, a little bit of microprocessor, uh, MIMO, and so on and so forth. And Stanford had a strong AI group, you know, McCarthy and others. MIT, UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, in fact, US now has of the top 25, top 20 universities in the world, US has 15 top universities. So we really dominate this area. And so we have we come up with all these fundamental ideas. And so, and that seeded the industry and had some industry group. So it's a very innovation led industry. Let's talk about uh, the R&D expenditure in this industry. So uh, uh, typically uh, uh, the National Science Foundation, I'm, I'm leaving out all the defense funding from DARPA and all that, just the civil side. We pro NSF probably puts in about uh, $750 million into this area, in core ICT area, maybe a little bit more, and uh, mainly goes to universities. And then uh, when ideas emerge, which are useful to translate to, to, to products, then the VCs get involved. The VCs pump in about $30 billion into this uh, into these ideas. I myself have done three VC funded companies. And uh, for every million dollars you may raise from NSF, 
you would probably land up raising 100, 200 million dollars from VCs because it takes a lot that kind of money to build companies. And then of course uh, the companies grow. And today uh, this this business I pointed out earlier, I mean so soon is about uh, 450 billion in US, but 160 of which goes back to the R&D flow back. So you look at the R&D engine, it's really not, and government is a small part of it. VC is a little bigger, but really the plowback of R&D that's really driving the whole thing. So you need revenue to excel in, in, in R&D. Without revenue and industry and revenue, you don't have that. So you're really stuck at the very low levels. So it is, uh, we need to get to this to be able to drive forward. Professor, uh, may I just pause you here for, uh, as I've been sure. instructed by the organizers, uh, to pause uh, over here for about five to seven minutes and take a couple sure. of questions and then we'll proceed. Uh, sure. There are a couple of good questions there, but uh, let, let, let me just uh, uh, kick this off by making a comment and a question. Uh, you know, to set this in context, uh, Paul Kennedy, when he wrote this famous book uh, in the 90s called Rise and Fall of Great Powers, uh, he makes one simple assertion at a, you know about 800 pages of the book, and then there's a simple conclusion. The conclusion is this, that powers rise because of economic growth and economic prosperity, and powers fall, and there's a decline because they militarily overstretch themselves, and the economic engine just can't keep up with the uh, military requirements and the strategic requirements, which is why this whole, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between the United States and China uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in the technological space is extremely important because we have to watch the, the direction of these vectors and especially in between, uh, between the, uh, you know, the power trajectories of the two countries. So that's, that's the broad comment. I just want to set that in context. Now, as we, as we look at this, you made this very interesting point about headquarters uh, as the place where uh, you know, the decisions are made and where things can happen. And but we also know there is an ecosystem uh, which which is all around the headquarters, right? So there's a headquarters in one country, but the ecosystem is uh, international. Very often, it's global in nature. What do you think is the relationship between uh, the countries where this ecosystem exists and the country where the headquarters? I mean, in terms of power, right? Uh, can can the headquarters country strong arm itself and overpower the ecosystem country? No. For example, we just take Broadcom. Um, uh, in fact, let's let take my own company. Second company, uh, we had a lot of operations in India and India, a little bit in China, but mostly in India. And uh, uh, but we're a US company, and uh, yeah, we were building uh, you know, a technology called WiMAX. It's a 4G technology, uh, initial 4G technology. Uh, uh, but if the US government says you can't sell to India, you're not able to sell to India. But India was, I mean. We had probably 75% of our, our maybe 70% of R&D was in India. Extremely good, uh, good people. In fact, I used to go around the world saying the best wireless designers are sitting in India. I mean, I really meant sitting in my company. Extremely good, good people, but uh, but US government held the key. So it's, uh, uh, well, I mean, so I think uh, headquarters has, uh, and you know, it's difficult for, Malaysia, India, Philippines say, you know, we won't cooperate. I mean, we need the income and we need the jobs. So the headquarters company has has all the marbles. Right. So I think that's the thing, the trick which uh, many of us missed. In, in fact, this backlash against globalization is probably this. Because in the last 25 years, uh, globalization happened. We all, we thought we were participants in this entire uh, global system until uh, our friends in uh, China decided to pull the plug and you know exercise sovereign power, and now we realize the power of the headquarters. So I think what you're saying uh, sort of mirrors this fact that in the in the sense a lot of a lot of the world sort of missed this trick. They they forgot the fact that regardless of globalization and uh, global ecosystems, the power lies in the country where the headquarters is located and the and the government that uh, controls that country. Uh, Professor, there's another question here which is far more uh, I think. Uh, uh, related to this, but you know, the question is by Tyagarajan Mutayan who asks, uh, you know, why is it that there is a shortage of uh, critical semiconductors worldwide in the last two years? Is it because of the pandemic uh, and so on? No, as they say, as like pig bellies, if is a not not very popular name in India, but uh, 
they too go through the cycles of excess and uh, and and uh, and uh, famine. So basically, what happened was, I think in the early part of COVID, uh, uh, these companies, uh, you know, these are hundreds of billions of investment companies, began to scale back on scale on on build out because they thought that pandemic means uh, there'll be less market. So that happened early 2019. They all began to uh, reduce the expansion. Then what happened was. Uh, People began to buy laptops to get on Zoom calls like we are today. And uh, so the uh, devices became much more important. And uh, for some reason, even car sales just dipped earlier, uh, began to pick up. Uh, so the demand outgrew the planning that they had. So that's why there's a shortage. It will go away very soon. And in fact, I, got a, I, I can bet you next year there'll be a surplus because uh, this is such a high investment thing. They, they can't move very nimbly. And uh, you know, you're, when you're putting 15, 20 billions into a fab, you've got to really think through all the everything. So they tend to lag the market and that's the reason. Okay, thank you. Well, there's one question uh, and then we can go ahead. Uh, is this, uh, it's, it's a, I mean, it's set in a context, but if I take out the context, the question is really that uh, things are changing uh, in, the, in the future. The, the game changes very quickly. So what kind of, uh, investments do you need to make, uh, given the fact that uh, you know by the time you see the re uh, results of those investments, uh, technology would have changed. Right? If you're looking at a 10, 15 year horizon, how do you you know how do you think about what kind of technology to go into? I would actually talk about that towards the end of my talk, but just a brief preview is: we need two things: we need money and we need uh, knowledge. Both are becoming very difficult. Money is in trillions. Yeah. If you, for uh, example, uh, Mr. Uh, Xi Jinping has put 1.4 trillion on the table for fabs. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but they also, we need knowledge. If we, if we take TSMC, the leader uh, over here, they have 53% market share. Uh, they, they are the go-to fab in the world today. All the top, top chips, for like, example, the A1 chip from Apple that gets fabbed by them, they, uh, they would, of course, they have invested, but their real, real strength is knowledge and experience. It have, I mean, they have institutional memory of 30 years. So you cannot do these things in five years and 10 years. It takes decades to learn this thing, to understand it, and it requires trillions of dollars. So huge amount of experience and huge amount of money. So uh, it's a tough business to get into. Thank you, Prof. I think we can uh, we can go on and then uh, we'll come back again for the second round later. So we know we were talking about US. So US was really innovation led, and uh, we look at the R and D budget. In fact, it's the, it's the industry that's doing all the R and D. Of course, this is mostly product R and D, the next next gen next gen chip and so on and so forth. Uh, while NSF and uh, universities go and go and look at fundamental ideas. And of course, VCs are more, uh, you know, take these ideas and groom them forward to become, uh, become you know, viable companies. So that's the, that's the uh, US story. Now, uh, what about China? So China, if you look at their, uh, I mean, I know China well, I still as a teach there, I still, have, I still write papers with students there. Uh, they, uh, there's nothing like uh, this fundamental ideas. No fundamental ideas come from China. They may have had it a thousand years ago, but not today. So, but China has just a lot of patents in productization. For example, in 5G, the, the standard we talk about, they dominate that. They probably out of 25,000 patents, they probably have 12,000 patents. So China Inc. probably has 16,000 patents. So they dominate patents, but these are on top of the fundamental ideas. So, but they're relevant for, for, for products. So their base actually came from manufacturing. So these names you may not know, Huaquin, Wingtech, Longchair. So these were big manufacturing giants. And uh, they began to understand the tech from bottom up. And of course, then they began to add value and they went up to higher and higher components. So they began to build a supply chain. So eventually they started building fabs too. And uh, so it started from there. And then they began to climb this rope, climb this ladder. So if you look at annual R&D investments, uh, uh, PRC government probably puts about two billion into this area, uh, uh, probably around that. And then, of course, they have now started building uh, Shinga top research universities, uh, Tsinghua, Beijing, Xi'an. 
they actually have, Shimba is probably within the top 25 in the world now. And they have about seven universities in the top 100, and about 50 in the top 500. So they are really, starting with 1980s, they've come very, very fast. And their VC investments in this area is about 30 billion also, I think comparable to, to US investments. And their plowback is uh, given their GD, given they are very little lower because they are a little bit more on the low end manufacturing. I mean, they are not at the, you know, the IP, you know, they're they not so fundamental as uh, US is, but the government is pumping about 100 billion into that. So today, their R&D is higher than the United States. So, uh, so it's about 250 billion of R&D just in this core ICT area. And I think a lot of it, I mean, I think, I think it's probably more than 100 billion because they, they have put more than a trillion on the table for just fab alone. And uh, I've sort of observed China quite a bit. I know a lot of their things. They have not been, never been very successful in fabulous companies. And I'll talk more about that later. Yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, all the investments in R&D for the the, uh, the issues is that uh, uh, is uh, uh, what are the outputs that come out of uh, out of all these investments? And so I, I got 2016 numbers, so they're not really current. But if you look at patents, uh, China was about uh, 1.3 million filed in CNC and IPA. That's the Chinese patent office. So about 45 percent global filings. And US had about 600,000 filings in USPTO, which is our, our office here. But I wouldn't really put that much uh, value on this because, you know, uh, very few of the patents really make it make, make sense. I, I think the US Patent Office, only one in 16,000 patents get honored as being elected to the Hall of Fame. So they make, you know, they are trillion dollar industry patents. But uh, uh, so it's not clear how much the value China has here. But the so-called triadic patents, these are patents where you know has a lot of industrial value. So you will normally file in USPTO and EPO with European Patent Office and in Japan Patent Office. So those are called triadic, and they have you know, to pursue one of those one of those patents across these and maintain them could easily be two hundred thousand dollars. It's a lot of money, and I myself have done it, but it's very very painful. China has only about twenty percent of US filings. This is twenty sixteen. It may be I think maybe higher now, but that's the number I have. In terms of research publications. Uh, uh, broadly priority with US in many areas, but I think ahead of US in AI and biotech uh, areas, I think. In fact, the other day I was in a conference uh, and I think, uh, you know, you could see China is dominating in AI. So their they're, they're, papers are really good. I actually still you know, work, uh, you know, write papers with them in wireless. I'm they're very, very good students there, very good students. And uh, the, the, among the top 1% cited papers, which are the highest impact, US was double of China just, uh, in 2016. I think this may be similar or maybe a little, little lower now. Okay, now we, let's talk about hard output. This is the real output that actually matter. And uh, so we know that this total is $1.5 trillion. And uh, the, uh, let's look at these, uh, these figures. Again, it's a, a country allocation by based on headquarter country. And the figures are value added figures. For example, if, if I'm Broadcom, I'm fabbing a chip, uh, I, if I'm designing a chip, uh, I get some revenue part of it, but I then I, some of the revenue will go to, to the fab. So I allocate uh, appropriate to fab and to the <coughs> design house. So in semi -fab, semiconductor companies, fabless, big names are NVIDIA, Qualcomm, Broadcom, um, uh, Marvel, uh, all these companies you're, you're familiar with, uh, uh, US is really dominant, $120 billion a year, very dominant. Uh, this, we really have got it right. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, China has, uh, in fact, probably more companies than US, uh, but, uh, but they're nowhere near the United States. Um, their, their top uh, fabulous is, uh, uh, is, uh, is high silicon, I think. And there are a few, quite a few other companies, but uh, I know from you know, my discussion in China that they're always worried about the fact they're lagging. They're not being able to catch up with the United States here. And the uh, ROW, rest of about 50. Uh, South Korea, certainly, uh, Samsung. Taiwan has got MediaTek. Uh, Israel has got a number of uh, fabulous companies. 
And Europe, uh, certainly ARM in the UK and, uh, and, uh, and Infineon and so on and so forth. So US is the dominant thing and China and US and our rest of the world are similar. So that's about $220 billion here. Semi-fab, including optical optofab, uh, uh, US and China are fallen behind. I mean, US has fallen behind, it's about 24 billion, I think, in terms of fab revenue. And China uh, has got a lot more fabs and many more companies, but they're also 25 billion. Uh, the big numbers are outside the United States and China, 240 billion. A lot of it is Taiwan, USMC and TSMC, and Samsung. So Samsung, this, uh, Taiwan has maybe close to 60% and Samsung 17%. So they really dominate the space. Consumer systems, uh, these are uh, you know phones, laptops, uh, all the stuff we have at home, TVs. Uh, uh, US has got about 240 billion, and a lot of it is Apple. Apple revenue is probably half of that. Uh, and then other half is a fair amount of stuff in smart homes and other things which are doing well. And China, of course, is even larger. China is the uh, manufacturing giant for phones. I mean, the, they, the Chinese phones dominate the world. Uh, uh, I mean, they're bigger than Samsung and then, than Apple. They have Oppo. Uh, uh, Zomi, all these brand we sell, we buy in India. And the uh, rest of the world's 120 billion and uh, Europe, South Korea, of course, the Samsung, Japan, little bit Japan. Enterprise system, these are, you know, uh, base stations, for wireless base stations, uh, uh, server, server farms, uh, data centers. So their uh, US is not so strong. China is the manufacturing giant, so they have a lot of presence here. And, uh, and, uh, and there's also a reasonable amount outside uh, 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 enterprise systems, outside uh, these two countries. Uh, I think Europe uh, with, in, with Ericsson and, no and, uh, Ericsson and um, Nokia, uh, two big uh, wireless players uh, have a certain amount of revenue. South Korea has got Samsung, and there's also uh, a few other companies in, uh, in Taiwan and Japan, 120 billion. Assembly and test is a low, uh, 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 low skilled area because uh, when you put a phone together, the components have all the value and they are, well, some of them are very, very high tech. But the tech required to put a phone together uh, or even put a, put a base station together is not very high. The instrumentation required, the, the assembly line is very high tech. And sometimes already completely robotized. But in the US has very little manufacturing, so not much space. China is the dominant uh, thing. They, they are trying to get rid of this business because a lot of it is low tech. So for 20, um, 20 of, uh, of the 70s sitting here with uh, Vietnam is a big player, Thailand. Taiwan traditionally was strong, but they've been moving out because they want to, it's, it's, it's a low value add. India is trying to get in. So we are now trying to build some of this stuff here. Yeah, but do, uh, I didn't get into this market but it's very low skills and the value add is very, very nominal. So that's about $1.5 trillion. And uh, um, so you can see basically semi-fabulous US dominates. And I think this has been, this has been so all the time that we're not given it up. Semi-fabs, unfortunately, we have fallen behind. Uh, consumer systems uh, also, you know, we had a lot more companies, but uh, it shrunk quite a bit. But Apple has been a, a superstar for us. Uh, enterprise systems, uh, China has taken over. And uh, so that's the big picture. So uh, we're coming back to core ICT. Uh, if we look at US economy, uh, this whole area is about 4 trillion. I'm sorry, this is globally, um, let me get, get this right, yeah. Globally is about 4 trillion. And uh, globally, this part is 1.5 trillion. And, uh, uh, and, in, and for US, it, that's about, I think it's about uh, 400 billion. So it's about 2% of our economy. But, uh, but uh, this sector is underlies everything else. So it is really the engine that drives the entire GDP system. So that is another reason why everybody is focused on this technology, compute, telecom, AI, semiconductors. So it's really an engine of progress. And uh, we don't have that, uh, you really uh, don't have any standing anywhere else. 
Um, of course, you can import the technology like uh, many countries do, but then uh, you know, the cost of imports is high. And then of course, uh, it's also you potentially, uh, you know, you're at risk of being denied technology. Okay, now let's look at uh, how US uh, grew, uh, the uh, US path to sort of uh, <clears throat> to global domination. So, uh, uh, so you know, started off as a uh, very strong in mass production in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, we won the Second World War. Uh, we helped win the because of a huge manufacturing uh, capability. I was once giving a talk to Admiral Pereira's lecture to the Navy and mentioned how in one year we went from a empty ground to within one year manufacturing, I think, six or seven major aircraft on that, on that ground within one year. So it's a huge manufacturing engine. It's still so. Uh, at least in defense, but I think uh, in commercial, we have moved it away to China. Then what happened was that uh, the 1945 or so, uh, when the war was going on, uh, there's a professor, Vannevar Bush, who was a uh, uh, very uh, Christian person, who was an advisor to Roosevelt and Terman, a later Terman, uh, to Truman. And he uh, 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 advised uh, to, uh, that we should form a partnership of universities, industry, and government the triple helix. So, uh, that, so Roosevelt agreed with that. And there was a famous paper called uh, uh, The Science, The Endless Frontier, 75th anniversary celebrated last year. And that led to the formation of NSF, National Science Foundation. So it began to fund universities. And I also got NSF funding when I joined Stanford. Then in the 1950s, the uh, Soviet Union gave a surprise. Uh, they launched Sputnik. So there was a huge shock in the US. So we then began to, we formed DARPA, we also formed NASA to, ca to catch up with, with the US. And we actually did. By 1969, we put a man on the moon. So it was a remarkable, remarkable progress. And then of course, rise of research universities. So like Stanford, uh, till the, till, I would say till about the 50s, it was not really heavy into technology. There was a little bit in the E department, but not that much else. But uh, then began to get a lot of funding and, and Stanford became a huge engine for research, likewise MIT and others. And uh, uh, we're also, uh, uh, and of course, uh, in part, we helped form Silicon Valley. Many of our faculty members uh, and sometimes students have formed these iconic companies. Uh, for, for example, Google came out of Stanford and, and Sun and so on and so forth. And Silicon Valley began to grow. And uh, in fact, it started with the, in the 1950s with, with Dr. Shockley, who came from Bell Labs to set up Shockley Labs. And he had very, very bright people, but he was not a, I mean, uh, he wasn't, wasn't a popular CEO. So they left and joined Fairchild and later on they left and joined, formed Intel, all these big names, uh, uh, Bob Noyes and others, uh, uh, Andy Grove. And, uh, and, uh, and it turns out Intel was the first company to have a big IPO in 1971. And some of the investors like, uh, like Rock uh, made a lot of money. So then you know, VCs, VC industry grew because banks realized that high tech can give a lot of money. So now VC industry is a huge part of uh, Silicon Valley. I also work with them. And they're right behind, not very far from where I'm talking, it's about half a mile, one mile away is the Sand Hill Road where a lot of money gets dispensed, all these famous iconic firms. And uh, of course, all this made the United States global. So we have reach, uh, we, we do R&D all over the world. We manufacture all over the world. I mean, largely, largely in China, but uh, so it's become really a huge, powerful engine. And uh, so all of a sudden, the success story, but there are some, some clouds in terms of some areas where it began to fall behind. So what about China? So China, uh, in the pre-Ming area, they were I mean, very tech savvy. I mean, almost any invention, gunpowder, compass, printing, even white sugar. In fact, India, we call chini. And chini is actually China because white sugar came from China or China itself, with porcelain. And uh, so uh, they were huge uh, tech engine. But then what happened was they, had, they invented the, uh, the civil service system and the civil bureaucrats uh, were not interested in technology. So they were more interested in calligraphy and uh, poetry and prose. So, so that got shunted out. And really, China sort of went to sleep. And then the revolution, when Mao took over, 
he was keen on technology. He actually wrote to President Truman uh, twice, actually asking for help, but US never replied. So he went to the Soviet Union, got some help from them. But then of course he got involved with this social reformation with Great Leap Forward and, uh, and uh, Cultural Revolution, which are pretty disastrous for science and technology. Many universities closed. And uh, then after Mao died, a couple of other presidents, and then Deng Xiaoping came along in, in, in the early 80s. So he was a truly a visionary person. He decided to open up China and he did many, many things. One is we started pushing money into research universities. So Huawei and Beijing University and uh, um, uh, Pinyard University started emphasizing their growth. And then uh, he did something else, which is very, very uh, uh, prescient was to send scholars abroad. So China has spent over 150,000 scholars abroad to all the top universities in the world. And Stanford at any time would normally have about 500 of them, all funded by the uh, Chinese government. And I've hosted a few in my own group. So they come with their own money. <clears throat> and uh, they try to, you know, it's a, China really invaded all these universities and, uh, uh, and uh, they would bring their own money and, uh, and it, it was a fantastic way of learning technology. And then later there was also began to attract talent. So they began to hire uh, almost every prominent US professor was involved in China in some form or other. And they also like, hired full-time professors uh, also uh, from around the world, but including in the United States. That doesn't normally work that well because uh, you know, China is a, all, you know, it's a, you, you can't function in English in China, and, you know, not good school for children. So mostly people end up as short-term professors. And some of my students have spent time in China too. So they really began to suck in talent, uh, knowledge and talent by going out and coming back, bringing back talent and the thousand talents program and this many, many things. So I can talk about it forever. And then they began to build mega infrastructure, Shenzhen and, uh, and then the technology park in Beijing and uh, Hangzhou. So massive, massive infrastructure. So all that actually was initiated by Deng. And, uh, and then there were a couple of other presidents who came and then she came in 2014. So he, uh, she, I think, uh, took a much, uh, 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 I would say a more expansive view of China, because China was already rising. And uh, uh, in fact, well, Deng used to say, you know, uh, hide your strength and bide your time. Uh, she sort of openly said, you know, no, we, we want to be in the world now. So he proposed the 2025 plan and the 2045 plan. 2025 plan was fairly modest. He just said that uh, something like 60%, I don't know the number, of Chinese Chinese uh, consumed uh, tech, tech products should be Chinese origin. That is, they should have Chinese IP. And by 2045, uh, he, was, he was some threat to US. He was saying something like 40% or 30% of, of global products should have Chinese IP. So, uh, 20, uh, still, uh, still 25 years ago away. Uh, but I think that really uh, got US upset because uh, US has huge stakes in technology and the huge profits that we made that US began to move and, uh, and that really finally, finally scared, uh, scared uh, the United States. I still remember uh, in 2018, I was, uh, I attend, sometimes attend the Chinese academies meetings in Beijing. Uh, I'm an academician in China. And she, this time Xi Jinping spoke for 90 minutes. So maybe like 30 minutes was on, on, uh, on, on semiconductor. He was analyzing all the technologies and where China is not doing well, where it should do well. And uh, he knows all the details very well. So, uh, but I think uh, his, uh, uh, his openness of uh, ambitions, I think has scared the United States so now there's a lot of backlash. <clears throat> so let me, uh, yeah. Yeah, can we just uh, do a couple sure. of, because there are a lot of questions. And uh, you know the, the the organizers have suggested this thirty minutes plus question answer format. So I'll try and uh, try and do this as much as I can. I'm trying to lump some of these questions together so that uh, we can address the things instead of going in serial order. Uh, the first uh, question really is about uh, it's a it's a segue from the previous session that if governments have control uh, on uh, headquarters and what companies do, how can they leverage this? 
And one of the examples mentioned was that Bloomberg had a story a couple of years ago of uh, chips, uh, you know, backdoors being installed on chips uh, uh, and, uh, you know, at the request of governments. Uh, is this kind of uh, leveraging possible or, you know, in general, what are the big ways to leverage? Uh, I can't answer that question. <clears throat> okay. I'm a US so, citizen, uh, so I won't answer that question. Okay, so it's fine. Then uh, maybe, uh, but do you think in general, uh, governments will be able to leverage uh, control on uh, technology to push their agenda? I don't know, but you know, uh, you can be sure that uh, uh, US companies uh, serve US national security interests. So obviously there's a coupling there. It has to be. I mean, if uh, there's an Indian company which control technology, uh, uh, you know, they have to serve Indian security interests. Right. Okay. Uh, now, the second question, uh, set of questions is about uh, FAB's uh, uh, semiconductor fabrication. Uh, environmental and employment implications. Uh, what would you, uh, you know, what would you say are the environmental and second uh, employment implications? No, I think uh, uh, this industry got a bad rap because in the in the 70s and 80s, when a lot of fabs came up, in fact, where I'm talking now, we have probably a fab 50, 100 yards away. There are a lot of, you know, these, these, these fabs use a lot of uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, poisonous chemicals, and there were a lot of poisoning of groundwater. In fact, even now they're pumping out groundwater to reform the water. So, uh, so there have been some bad actors. But today's fabs, so TSMC or in China or even in Intel fabs we have in Arizona. I think uh, they are very well controlled in environmental impact. So there's, the, there's no issues there, I think. I mean, they're extremely well controlled. Of course, they need a lot of electricity, they need a lot of water and adequate supply and reliable supply is critical. But uh, I wouldn't say environmental impact is really an issue. And employment, do these uh, industries create a lot of jobs? Um, see, FAB's employment is all at very high level. I mean, they have, if you are, talk to TSMC, the water, it is money that's stopping them. Uh, they would say not so much, um, maybe not even, I mean, certainly experience, but also talent. The, um, a lot of them are PhDs. They need very, very talented people. It's really talent and ex talent, really high, the, you know, really top talent is the real blocker in these areas. Of course, it needs experience too. You can't just put a raw talent to the run a fab, but it's uh, very high quality people, uh, very highly trained, and uh, and that is is really a a, 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 a a real critical resource for these fabs. Right. So in that sense, it's not a mass job creation engine, right? It's a not a top, it's not a highly a specialized. Not. I think uh, they they don't they you know not at all. I don't. I think. Uh, um, in terms of job creation, it is very, very small. Where their job creation is in this low-tech, low-skills area I mentioned before. Uh, let's go to that. Yeah, in this assembly in test is really low skills. I mean, uh, typically you only need high school or middle school to be able to run, sit on these lines and, uh, and put, put parts together. And typically women are used for these things where they have much better control over their fingers. So this is low skills and this can create jobs. I mean, Chinese, China has tens, I mean, they employ millions in these, in, in, who are in fact into DOMs. Uh, and, uh, but this has got employment potential, but low levels. These are all, you know, all, are all easily PhDs mostly and uh, uh, certainly masters. Right. Uh, I'll now sort of move uh, gradually into this uh, related topic about TSMC and Taiwan. There are quite a few questions about how did uh, Taiwan uh, in general as a country and TSMC in particular achieve the kind of dominance in the industry that they have today? I probably will, uh, let me touch on it later because I think I will, I will get into it at one point. So okay. we can defer that question. Yeah. Okay, we'll defer that. Uh, 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 now we have a series of basket of questions around the socialization of technology, two or three people have asked this, you know, in the sense that uh, how, how are the US and China in terms of the diffusion of technology through society, how are they dealing with it? For example, uh, in concrete cases, like uh, in terms of the post pandemic, uh, you know, work environment, uh, working from home, et cetera, 
or data privacy how do how do uh, uh, the us and china look at these issues in terms of the social dimension of social uh, technology differently and does it make any uh, difference yeah, i'm not an expert in that area but one thing in china people are not sensitive to data privacy so the government has you know full access to data i mean they have this so called social merit program uh, it's called social credit program where they watch everything you do uh, through cameras and uh, including across the road jaywalking and then uh, you get merits and demerits and uh, if you get sufficient demerits you can't even travel out of the out of the city so uh, or you you know if you caught stealing uh, cheating on income tax and so on and so forth so you know, there the data is wide open and the, and the population is happy with it in united states is different we are very very privacy conscious so uh, so the uh, inroads that government can take into into people's lives is somewhat limited so we'll take one more question and then we can move on yeah. and this is about uh, the performance of the two countries in standards battles uh, in the us and china we saw patents but what about standard battles and there's a, a rider on this somebody asked about a 6g kind of a uh, issue yeah so uh, so uh, you know the china inc you know the zte and, and huawei mainly they dominate the standards i mean they were nowhere uh, i'll talk about in my next slide no way uh, 10 15 years ago but they really dominated to five. so in 5g that they dominate the standards standards in terms of ip yeah standard essential patents the patent families but of course uh, in ericsson nokia qualcomm uh, you know i'm talking about 3gpp which is the mobile standard uh, 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 qualcomm has got a lot of patents there ericsson and uh, ericsson and uh, and nokia but uh, i would say china is the dominant is dominant and uh, and you know these are very complex standards they're all based on by the way on mimo mimo pm which is my first company we built that mimo pm system so it's uh, so that's a foundation for all these uh, all these systems but uh, uh, but china dominates the standards yeah. and it's not easy to get things to the standard every every idea has to be thoroughly uh, thoroughly thoroughly simulated there are thousands of people attending it almost everybody is a phd so these are tough tough things to do and china you know fought and and, and got into the standards uh, but they're not uh, the us also is pretty strong thanks prof i think we can move on i just uh, note to the uh, to the people i think the scope of this this, this conversation today at the request of professor paul raj is us china dimension so i see a lot of questions and comments about india and indian policy that's out of the scope of today's conversation so we can have a longer conversation offline uh, about this but uh, let professor paul raj go on on his uh, so everybody said of huawei and uh, you know uh, meng beng zhao uh, the cfo was released only yesterday i think of three years uh, held in, in toronto and uh, held in canada so uh, uh, i've been to huawei a few times uh, It started in 1990, 1987, founded by you know with five thousand dollars of venture capital, and uh, Ren Zhengfei was the CEO, uh, former PLA officer by the way, and uh, I've never met I never met him, uh, but uh, he was uh, he started uh, distributing PABXs in his office switches from Hong Kong, so he's just a distributor, and uh, he was drawing uh, his working capital was a thirty percent interest, so <laughs> it was a tough time to uh, tough way to start a business. But by 1993, he had developed his own rural telephone exchange, and by 1995, uh, he began to reverse engineer uh, U.S. products. In the, famously, the Cisco router, he reverse engineered, and uh, lots of—I mean, there was a lot of cheating going on. He got caught. Uh, 1996, uh, China government uh, now began to pay attention to him. They called him a national champion. He began to get a lot of government contracts. and by 2004 they began to expand worldwide uh, in sales joint ventures uh, they got a lot of money from soft loans from china development bank and uh, and they began to build r&d centers all over the world from stockholm to sweden to london to i mean stockholm to london to to uh, uh, here in san jose uh, they have, they also have one in bangalore uh, uh, paris uh, bonn uh, or berlin all over the world and uh, their revenue is about 110 billion dollars and about 200,000 manpower and of course they now on the entities list of united states so they denied a lot of technologies uh it went in 2004 i would have my second company i was trying to sell chips so i used to go to them to try and sell my chips 
But I was, uh, that time I had written my first, my MIMO book, which is the first textbook in MIMO. So I remember in 2004, when I went to them, uh, they were long, they had already created a Chinese, with, with permission from Cambridge University Press, they had a Chinese, a Chinese language version of my book. So there'll be 150 people lined up to get my signature. But in my lectures, they never asked very good questions. They obviously didn't understand too much. By 2007, they were pretty good. They were asking very good questions. By 2009, I must say, they had some of the, some of the mathematics in the systems are very abstract, you know, things like you know, division algebras and some of that I don't understand myself. So they began, they began to ask questions which I couldn't answer. So they ran very, they came up, ramped up very, very quickly. And of course, then they began to dominate the 5G standards and, uh, and 4G also, they were dominant. So it's a big success story for China, but I think it's uh, really unnerved in the United States. So they are uh, under sanctions, uh, deny of technology, and I think it's hurting the company, I believe. And of course, you know, the CFO was locked up. She was released only yesterday. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, what drives uh, uh, US uh, and uh, China towards, I mean, all it was the US is the incumbent, uh, China is the challenger, it's what's driving them. Well, I think US, I think uh, uh, US policy countries serves the economic interests of the government. And the economic interest is really the interest of the, of the top 1%, 2%, because the average Joe in the United States hasn't really seen any growth in his income for 50 years. So the very rich actually have benefited from all this technology and the profits. And there's a, normally a joke in the United States which says that uh, there are only two things important for in politics and politics and uh, policy. The first, of course, is money. The second is, uh, I forget. So it's money. And um, so uh, to, to protect our interests, uh, now we need a military and we have it all over the world. And also have, we also control the financial levers of the world. Uh, we have a global currency, we have, we have IMF, uh, we control the World Bank. So we are the ruling hegemon. And uh, and we see, I think, United States sees China as a threat to its core economic interests and the massive profits that we have made over the years. Uh, and so, obviously, is reacting to it. I mean, anybody would react. They don't want to be displaced. But U.S. also has very major, major problems. It's a very divided country, shocking inequality. And the middle class is virtually disappearing. But right now, I think uh, uh, the government is focused heavily on China, very heavily on China. So what about, what about China? So China's policy serves the interests of the communist Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. And what drives them, you know, and some of you will know this, they have this huge issue about 100 years of humiliation. They felt that in 1840 to 1860, the opium wars, uh, they were really humiliated. And this is done by East India Company using Indian soldiers and Indian opium. And, uh, uh, then the Japanese invasions in the 1890s and, uh, and the 1930s. Uh, then, of course, US and uh, many other countries were fishing in China. So in companies, uh, we also find a plaque saying that we'll never let this happen again. We have to stand up. So that, I think, is a very dri big driving factor for the Communist Party as well as for the people. Also, I think the C CPP must also has to make sure there's continued growth because, you know, it is a, it is a very, uh, 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 what I would say is a very tightly controlled economy, uh, their country. So, uh, so a lot of things are kept canned up, but as long as the growth is there, I think most people are sort of, uh, they agree with it to go along, but that keep growing and that is not easy anymore. And the third important thing for them is Taiwan. Taiwan was always a part of China, but after the revolution, you know, Chiang Kai-shek went there. So they want to claim it back and, uh, and the uh, US agrees that it's a Chinese country, but Chinese land, but they want it to be done peacefully and uh, so not sure where it will go. But I think Taiwan uh, continued growth and this uh, you know, 100 years humiliation is what drives China. And they want to get closer to US technology. I don't think they think they can overtake them, but get closer. And certainly they're building up the military power. And uh, uh, in the 80s and 90s, you know, it was a huge partnership between the US and China. You, China could no, do no wrong. We went and invested uh, heavily in China. And when they wanted transfers, we actually we did technology transfer to them. The more they could do for us, the more profit we made. But they were really low cost, high quality. But now everything has changed because now we found that 
the children are grown up to you know become bigger than their parents. And uh, uh, Pachana also has huge problems. I mean, they have you know certainly corporate and household debt is huge. Uh, we all heard of Evergrande and their problems, but there's a lot of debt in, in China. And the GDP growth is slowing. That's a problem for the Communist Party. And also, you know, they have a lot of state-owned enterprises, something like our PSUs. But there, of course, if a CEO doesn't deliver, you know, uh, he's handled very, dealt with very, very roughly. And, uh, but uh, they're still, uh, you know, a socialist society. So they still believe in state-owned enterprises and uh, there are various me mechanisms to make them work. Uh, but still, they're not so efficient. And now the US chokehold is really a problem for them. So China is, uh, is also under a lot of pressure. So, so what about uh, US concerns, sorry. US concerns, I think our big concerns are really 5G and the clearly 5G infrastructure, you know, China is, uh, uh, Huawei is considered to be number one, I think for good reasons. And uh, uh, they've spent, they've probably spent $20 billion building that technology. And, uh, and US, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, despite all the noise and talk, we still don't have 5G technology in the United States. I mean, uh, in, 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 in phone chips, yes, Qualcomm is the number one supplier of phone chips, 5G, but not infrastructure. I'm, I know the, the infrastructure well because I work in that industry and I keep tearing my hair out because we still haven't come up with a solution. So today we, we may deploy, we're still deploying Ericsson and Nokia uh, technology. AI also Chinese, because their applications are very well developed, but also in chips, they are seen to be ahead. I mentioned the Baidu chip earlier. In quantum technologies, uh, they have this quantum encryption, which is uh, they keep openly talking about, uh, which seems to be working. And, um, and uh, in quantum computing, it's not clear whether those things are really real for anybody, but they, don't, they have their own claims. So US has a lot of complaints over China. And uh, first is uh, idea of forced joint ventures. So whenever we wanted to enter China, they would demand that uh, uh, to sell, they'll say, no, you have to form a joint venture. And a bit like what we do in US India with, uh, with offset programs. And, uh, and US now objects to that, saying that you know, we forced us to travel, tra transfer technology. And then of course, industrial espionage. I mean, every country does it. But I think China does it in industrial scale. And, uh, and uh, so I think that's uh, clearly a uh, worry for the United States. And also sloppy patent protection. Uh, and Chinese uh, agree, uh, some of what happens is patents sometimes cut both. When I was running my company, every morning I would be worried about my, my mailbox. I'll get a letter saying from someone saying that you have to stop, stop production because you're violating my patent. And, uh, and the patent card is totally worthless, but you still have to go and fight in a court. It costs ten million dollars. So Chinese, for these smaller during the startup phases, they don't they don't protect anybody from patents. So let them fight it out. So some of that is happening, but certainly U.S. has, has genuine worries about patent protection. So now, <clears throat> what about U.S. response? Uh, this anybody knows what this means? This means think she means stop. So. So I think uh, uh, 5G and AI are really threatening to United States dominance. And so we began to create an entities list where number of companies are, cannot get tra tra technology from US or US allies. And so we certainly have focused on semiconductors and they now, for example, to go to from 12 to go to five, they will need a, a lot of equipment from ASML, um, applied materials and LAM research we have blocked all that access to that equipment. Uh, we have cut res research relationship with, with, with US universities. Uh, I know uh, I'm not, I've not been active at Stanford research some time, I retired, but some of my colleagues who were working with Huawei, for example, had, had to stop working with them. And uh, also they have blocked investments uh, by China into US VC firms, because they thought that would be a conduit for technology. So there's a law for lucifious law, right? All of us had to, VC firms had to, had to get audited by lawyers to make sure that there is no Chinese money in these firms. So um, I'm getting towards end. Uh, so, so what's next? Uh, I think this bipartisan agreement, whether it's a Republican or a thing that uh, 
or a Democrat that China is uh, China threatens U.S. economic interests, and uh, you know we are the number one, so we we have to remain number one. But there's also a lot of conflict. A lot of China is the biggest market for U.S. technology, biggest market. Boeing and uh, Intel, all these companies sell heavily to China, and also uh, we also manufacture in China. For example, Apple, if it didn't have Chinese manufacturing, cannot cannot ship products. So on one hand we you know, we worried about China. On the other hand, we need it. So there are lots of, a lot of complexity in this. And China has been, you know, has, seems to have the money. So though it's sometimes inefficiently used, so they pour a lot of money into industries. And US has the innovation, innovation engine. Now we attracted talent from all over the world. So fundamental ideas, we still, we still dominant. But one thing is, it does take a long time, 20 years from an idea to, to an industry. So well, China seems to moving a little faster the way they go. And the US also, you know, we'd like to, I think government wants to fund industry, but there's no easy way of doing it because you know, all industries here are Wall Street driven. You give money to a company, they will go and buy back their stock and push up stock prices and get bonuses. So it never worked. So I don't know whether it'll ever work again, if ever work. So US has its own problems and, uh, and China has diff uh, different problems. So I don't think there's a good consensus uh, so within the US or in China, it's how to deal with this problem. So it's really not in a good, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So your, China is now shifting back much more to the left and uh, yeah, sort of pushing up nationalism and uh, pushing back on US allies. And, you know, we have problems with them in India. And, uh, and uh, so I think uh, they're feeling the pressure and US is also feeling the pressure to make sure that you know, we don't get overtaken. So this, uh, uh, my last slide before the final one is, <coughs> how do you succeed in the industry? <coughs> so in, uh, you need to you need investment and now look, increasing looks like trillions of dollars. <coughs> and you need knowledge and that requires decades. Decades of knowledge and trillions of dollars. That's what you need to succeed. So this is not for, this is not for faint heart, faint hearted. And uh, you look at China, they are, they are okay doing well in systems, consumer and, uh, and uh, enterprise systems, but, uh, but not doing that well in semiconductors. Uh, so particularly in fabulous. So they, have, they got to, so they have a lot of investments available, but knowledge is still missing in some areas. United States has certainly a knowledge advantage. We've been at it for much longer, but our investment problem is a problem. We cannot invest like Chinese can do. So both of us are falling short of uh, where we need to be. But the one country we seem to have got it right is, is Taiwan. So, so we've got to learn a lot from them. So finally, let me come to this final slide. This is called the Thucydides, Thucydides trap. So you know, it's worth recalling from history, specifically from 450 BC in ancient Greece, Thucydides, this uh, historian soldier, wrote the history of the first Peloponnesian War in which Sparta and Athens fought a bloody war. He wrote that the rise of Athens and the fear that instilled in Sparta made war inevitable. The Harvard professor, Alison Graham, wrote a book called Destined for War on what he calls the Thucydides trap, where the challenge of a rising power and the Parania Paronia creates the ruling power often leads to war. In fact, he's looked at 20 cases in the world history, 16 of them went to have led to war. The question, of course, now is that whether China, a rising tech power, challenging the United States, the ruling tech power, will trap the two countries in a war. A war is far more consequential than Athens and Sparta 2,500 years ago. Both these are nuclear powers. So let us hope a better sense prevails. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Professor. You know, uh, this the, the last slide which you put out just uh, connects to what I was uh, saying earlier, that ultimately uh, the, the, the trajectory of powers, whether it's China or United States, it's going to be determined by uh, military expenditure and military responsibilities. And at some point, uh, when military responsibilities and military expenditure exceeds the ability to fuel your economy, you start uh, going downwards. And that's the uh, 
you know, a massive am- amount of empirical evidence which Paul Kennedy has uh, accumulated to show. And what uh, Alison says, the only comment I would like to make on Alison because I work on uh, these issues is that uh, conflict is not foreordained in the sense that anything in human affairs, there's nothing, it's not, uh, it's not a law of nature. We could, we could always change this. Uh, the indications definitely are towards uh, greater conflict. And, you, you, you know, uh, people are already worried about the, the angle of Taiwan because it intersects right in the middle of this conversation right, where Taiwan is a disputed uh, territory according to Ch- China. Taiwan also is the center of the world semiconductor industry. And what about uh, a situation where the Chinese uh, decide to either take Taiwan by force or uh, create problems which will create uh, ripples in the semiconductor industry? Maybe there's a, there's one more question which I would like to answer, which is uh, which is uh, which is posed here. But maybe you could start with this: What would be the impact of something like that happening? Like Taiwan? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay. I don't want to get into geopolitics, but uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, the US view is that Taiwan is Chinese territory, but uh, China should not do it by force. And uh, there's not much likelihood that uh, Taiwan will actually join uh, uh, China voluntarily. The, the question is that, uh, you know, do we want a nuclear war? And the nuclear war, of course, both, both countries and the world will be wiped out. So that might constrain things, um, but at, at this point, I would say is that the the the, uh, the fear in Washington is very very high that they may be overtaken. But that's a that, that's you know when you're number one, you have uh, you don't want to be displaced. The fear in China, I think, partly it is saying that you know we don't want to be dominated by the West again, is also very high. So and I think we are in very very dangerous times, very dangerous times, and there may be just some you know, some minor incident which can trigger something. So these are, uh, uh, so I, I would be very worried. I just hope uh, China doesn't want to do anything foolish and not as US do anything foolish. Right. Uh, I think this is a good point uh, for us to hand it over back to the organizers uh, because I don't want to spoil your wonderful en- ending uh, statement with the uh, further questions and discuss- discussion. So I think it's it's wonderful that it, let's not be stupid is a very, very good way to end a conversation like this. Thank you very much, Nitin. And thank you so much, Paul, for this uh, very fascinating webinar this morning. Um, I want to run over a few uh, some, some uh, summary points from today's uh, webinar as, as takeaways. Uh, Today, what we looked at is high tech as a battleground between basically the US and China. What we saw is, and and this was substantiated by a lot of figures and number of facts, that core ICT is the engine that drives GDP growth now and into the foreseeable future. We saw some of the telling numbers, which put in perspective what is happening in the US, in China, and the rest of the world with respect to high tech. And of course, the the various categories of high tech, what what is high tech and so on. So I think that itself was also a significant amount of learning for all of us. Uh, We saw that there has been a significant shift in uh, the way technologies are distributed between military and civil, what used to be military uh, driving everything, the the kinds of technology development, et cetera, has shifted. And now it is civil technologies that are pulling military technologies forward as well. Another important point is that of the 1500 or so billion dollars of global revenue in uh, core ICT, 500 billion is being plowed back into R&D. So there is, and that was one of uh, the the facts that highlighted uh, the the need for significant uh, um, investment for constant innovation, which is is of course what drives the industry. We had a very long discussion around uh, the fact that the, the country where a company is headquartered holds the major power in all of this balance. And that that is something we need to keep in the back of our minds as we 
looked at um, the rest of the discussion as well. The fab equipment itself is going to be a big battleground. It's, it's, it's going to be a, a huge, huge investment that any country, any company has to make going forward if you're looking at leadership in the space. And therefore, the, the need for fab equipment and investing in an innovation in that space. Uh, Professor Paul, Paul Raj then compared China and the US in terms of their respective models of technology growth uh, and, and then highlighted the areas where China is ahead, things like AI and biotech, uh, enterprise systems, 5G, et cetera, and areas where the US is ahead, like semi-fabulous, uh, and also a few areas where uh, the two countries are at par, such as consumer systems. The drivers for global superiority, uh, which as we saw is led by techno by high tech, uh, are, are different for the two countries. For the US, it is of course military ensuring uh, the sovereignty of, of the territory and so on. And uh, the, of course, the economic interest of the country. For China, a lot of that driver has been this, uh, the uh, idea of the 100 years of humiliation. We then went on to look at the relationship between the US and China and the complexity of this relationship because while, uh, while the US is an innovation engine and has been so for, for the last several decades, China is also the biggest market for US technology as well as the manufacturing base for US products. Uh, while there are issues such as IP protection, et cetera, that the US is very concerned about, as well as some other issues, which, which uh, Professor Paul, Paul Raj has highlighted. He then concluded by talking about success factors of uh, the investment that is required versus the knowledge advantage. While the US holds the knowledge advantage right now and uh, China, the investment advantage, we looked at Taiwan as a country that we need to learn from because they seem to have got a good balance of on both dimensions. But then, uh, as Nitin said, we ended at, at an interesting you know, point, which is that while each country has its, its problems, uh, which way is it all going to play out? There is, there is a good amount of tension in all of this. Uh, so there is a sort of an unease that is prevailing right now. All of us hope and wish that good sense will prevail all round. And uh, we come out of this in a manner in which we all are winners. Uh, so again, thank you very much for taking this time, Paul, to be with us. Uh, it, it's really been an honor and a privilege for us to have hosted this webinar with you. Uh, and we could really not have had a better both you and Nitin, we could not have had a better uh, panel for this uh, subject. So thank you very much to our viewers. Thank you for joining. Uh, we know it's a Sunday morning, so we really appreciate your having taken time to be with us. And of course, uh, this uh, the recording of this webinar is going to be on our uh, YouTube channel. Please look for the IATACB YouTube channel. We should have it up there on Monday. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, and Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sushi. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.